So here we are, Precalculus 11, section 5.3, uh, McGraw-Hill Ryerson Precalculus 11 textbook right here. And we are going to be looking today at radical equations. Okay? So we spent 5.1 and 5.2 talking about radicals. So if you have something that looks like, you know, the square root of 2, that's a radical. That's an irrational number. This is simplest form, simplest exact form. That is a radical. If you have something like this, you know, then you, this is an equation that has a radical in it. So that's a radical equation, for example. So we're going to learn how to solve uh, radical equations. So equations that have some kind of radical in them uh, and some kind of equal sign, right, equations. Uh, we're also going to be looking at, I mean, technically this is, technically this is not a radical equation because the uh, x isn't really under there. So radical equations, I believe in their, technically should have a variable underneath there, guys. So, um, just so, just so you know, I think we're, we're going to get to the definition here soon, but you're looking for a radical, you're looking for an equal sign. All right? Uh, these are the types of equations we're going to focus on today. All right, so you have a three-minute challenge. I'm going to give you three minutes right now. Um, let me read it really quickly. It says this, refer to the diagram right here. If the diagonal meter stick, so this is like a meter stick right here, 100 centimeters, diagonal meter stick, moves V centimeters down a wall. So the setup is this, you've got a meter stick on the wall, and you've got a meter stick on the ground, and you can look in your textbook for a little diagram beside, uh, on, on, on your page there, and you've got a meter stick leaning up against the wall, okay? So as this meter stick slides down the wall, V changes, and H changes, right? So as H gets bigger, so does V get bigger. And there's a relationship between H and V. So what I want you to do is, with a partner, and again, I'm going to give you three minutes to do this, I want you to determine the dimensions of the right triangle that's highlighted in blue here. And then number two, more importantly, write an equation describing V as a function of H. So you're going to write V equals something, something, something with an H in it. Okay? for step number two. Three minutes, go. Okay, so we've all had a chance to take a look at this. Let's take a look at question number one, okay? Uh, we talked about this briefly here. Uh, what are the dimensions of this triangle? Well, we've got H here, we've got 100 here, and what is this dimension right here? It is 100 minus V, right? Here's 100, and we subtract V from it, and that is the dimension of this side. Okay, so we've got 100 minus V, we've got H, and we've got 100. So write an equation describing V as a function of H. So basically, how are all of these three uh, terms related? So somebody give me your answer for V. Go ahead, really quickly, just fire away, it doesn't have to be right or wrong, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it in a second. I need, I need a few. Somebody from over here, go. Who's going to be first? V equals what? What'd you get? Let's hear it. All right. Uh, v equals 25. Okay. I'm not making fun of any answers here today. But thank you for saying V equals 25, and thank you for not saying anything, anybody else. Okay? Really, none of you guys got anything. 25 is better than nothing. Okay, what is it? What does number two say, guys? Listen, describing v as a function of h. Does anyone not see how these three are related? How are they related? Sorry. Sides of a triangle. Thank you. They are. They are three sides of a triangle. Yes. What kind of triangle do we have? Oh, really? We have a right triangle. Okay. No one saw this was a right triangle. Oh, and now, of course, once we get further in, there are going to be some of you saying, Oh, yeah, that's what I did. Oh, yeah, yeah that's what I got that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, right triangle. Guys, this is not hard. Not hard. Right triangle. So how are the sides of a right triangle related? What's something that you've been learning since you've been babies? Thank you. Pythagoras. Yes, Pythagoras. This is the hypotenuse. These are the legs. 100 minus V squared plus h squared is 100 squared. Okay? Did anyone do that? Liars. 
Okay. No, Liars. <laughs> you started here? Okay. So, you started here. Now, as far as getting V, so what you got to do from here then is isolate for V, right? So, how do we isolate for V? This is going to be maybe a little bit tricky because it's buried in here. Well, let's get rid of this to the other side. So, this is 100 squared minus H squared. We could probably simplify 100 squared. What's that? What's 100 squared? 10,000? Okay. So this is what we've got so far. How do I get V by itself? How do I, what do I get rid of next? Yeah, that's right. So you guys, uh, that's very good. Take the square root here now. Square root. Okay. Okay, now plus or minus. Okay, I'm glad you said that, plus or minus. When we're talking about dimensions, you're probably, you can consider the negative, but you're going to want to be careful about that. It's usually the positive because we're talking about dimensions, but yes, it is technically it's plus or minus, so we'll have to consider that. So this now becomes uh, 100 minus V equals the square root of 10,000 minus H squared. Okay, we're getting close. So what do we got to do now? Get rid of the 100, so we've got negative V equals square root of 10,000 minus H squared minus 100. Now I want V all by itself, so it's going to be a positive V. This is going to be a negative square root, 10,000, minus H squared plus 100. Okay? All right. So I was hoping that out of the 30-some of you here, somebody might have gotten something close to this. So Pythagoras, right triangles, think of Pythagoras. You could also think of sine, cosine, tangent if you want, but we're not really dealing with the angle. We're just talking about... V, right, a side length. So Pythagoras is what you want to get to. All right, so that may be an expression for V. Now let's just think about this for a second, the reasonability of this, okay? Stay with me here. So if H becomes greater, V is going to become greater, hmm. okay? So if H is zero, if H is zero, that means this meter stick here is right up against the wall. If H is zero, V should be what? If h is 0, v should be, did I hear someone say it? 0, yeah. Because this meter stick is standing right up against the wall and it's completely 100 centimeters, so v is 0. All right. So if h is 0, uh, if h is 0, what do we have? We have 10,000 minus 0. What's the square root of 10,000? It's 100. What's negative 100 plus 100? 0. 0. Negative 100 plus 100 is 0, not 100. Okay? So we're on the right track. Think about this. As V approaches 100, what should H approach? 100. Yes, 100. So as V gets closer and closer to being 100, that means this meter stick is getting closer and closer to being totally flat on the ground. Right? So if H is, sorry, if V is 100, then we've, then we've got... Um, H being 100 as well then. Okay? So this is working out. So that looks good. All right. Now, that was maybe a little bit of a tougher example to, very, to start off with, but this is the kind of stuff that you're going to need to think through. Okay? And this is certainly a radical equation because we do have, as I mentioned before, we have a variable underneath the root sign. So you can have a radical in an equation. If the variable's not underneath there, it's not technically considered a radical equation. It just has a radical in the equation. So, a radical equation is an equation with radicals that have variables in the radicands. The radicand is everything that's underneath the root sign. That's the radicand. So, if the variable's in there and it's an equation, you've got a radical equation. All right. So, two things with this one. We have to, we have to, find, um, we have to identify restrictions, okay? So, restrictions on the variable. Restrictions on the variable. Now, what are, so what I'm talking about is what values of x are not allowed? If we were to solve this, there would be, there might be a value or a set of values of x that are not allowed to be an answer. And that's because when the x is underneath the radical sign, you have the possibility of an x value making this uh, less than zero or making it negative, which mathematically, that's not good, right? So there are restrictions. That, the restriction is this. The 2x minus 1 
that's the, what's underneath the radical sign, must be greater than or equal to zero. And so in order to find restrictions, you have to think about things like you can't have a negative under the radical sign. So whatever's underneath there, that whole thing has to be zero or greater. And that's what we're exploring here. You can't have a zero in the denominator, right? Do you remember that? You can't divide by zero. So if there's any x value that would cause a zero in the denominator, that's not allowed. And so those are the two main things that you think of. So in order to find the restrictions on the variable or what the variable has to be and cannot be, you want to solve for x here. So it's just like solving for an equation, okay? Um, except for there's one difference when you're solving for a variable in an inequality. This is an inequality. Does anybody remember what that little rule is? If you're solving, maybe not. If you are solving for x, if you have to multiply or divide um, both sides of the inequality by a negative, by a negative, then you have to flip around the inequality sign. You have to flip it. That's the one little rule. You probably remember that now that I mentioned it. But we're not dividing or multiplying by a negative here, so I can leave that uh, inequality sign as it is. And so x has to be greater than or equal to 1 half. And so if we think about that just through logically, right, if it was equal to 1 half, that would be 2 times 1 half. That's 1. Minus 1 is 0. So it can be 0, but it can't be less than 1 half, all right? So x has to be greater than or equal to 1 half. If x was less than 1 half, like 0, you'd have 0 minus 1, the square root of negative 1. No good. So this is your restrictions on the variable. This is what the variable has to be. This is the positive sort of statement of what the variable has to be. You know, you could say the x cannot be less than 1 half. You can say it that way as well. Okay, but this is the way you would say it. All right, so that's step number one, find restrictions. Step number two, let's go ahead and solve this, okay? Solve. So we've done a little bit of work on this already in our initial example, okay? So now that I've given you an equation, this is just like the first one where we have to solve for V, right? Um, sort of thing. So let's see, how do we do that? I'm going to erase this here now. If we solve, we have to get x all by itself, so we'll, let's clear off everything that's outside of this radical here and get it to the other side. So I'm going to have this, root 2x minus 1 equals 12 minus 5, okay? Going to get it rid of this to the other side, so a positive 5 here becomes a negative 5 on the other side. Do I see that? So now I have root 2x minus 1 equals 7. I got to get the I got to liberate the x from the root sign. So I have to kind of like get rid of that root sign. What's the opposite of taking the square root? It is squaring, right? So what you're going to do now is you once you have the radical all by itself there, okay? That's that's when you know you can uh, square that. It's going to be real nice and easy. So the square root and the square cancel each other right out. They're opposite operations. So what you're left with is simply 2x minus 1 here. And 7 squared is 49. Okay? So we're now, we're, now we're really close. This is just simple algebra now. So 2x equals, we add 1 to both sides. 2x equals 50. Divide both sides by 2. x equals 25. Uh, yeah, you were, this is a, that was a different question. It said 25 for. I was you were, oh you meant this one. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, 25. This is okay. Oh, okay. All right. So, now the the final thing is here we have to check, okay? When we solve really 2a now is we have to check. And the reason why we have to check, guys, is this is because when we solve things algebraically, like when we square something, if you square a positive value, you get a positive answer. If you square a negative value, you get a positive answer. So you kind of have to check at the end because the uh, solving algebraically may fool you a little bit. It may, it may give you a result that's not actually plausible. So we have to double check this. We've already decided that x has to be here greater than or equal to 1 half, right? So this looks like it's going to be okay, doesn't it? All right, so let's check this out. So 5 plus the square root of 2 times 25 minus 1 equals 12. That's 5 plus the square root of 50 minus 1 equals 12. 5 oops, sorry, plus 
root 49 equals 12. So 5 plus 7 equals 12. Now, going back to your plus or minus, guys, if, you, if you're solving for an answer and you take the square root of a number, you, you do have to consider the positive and negative values of that root. Um, if, you're, if you've got a variable here um, and you're squaring, okay, uh, then we're just going to stick with the positive, okay? It's a little bit different. When you've got a variable in there, we're just going to stick with the positive. So you wouldn't say the square root of 49 is plus or minus 7. I mean, you could, but if you said, oh, it's minus 7, 5 minus 7 is negative 2, that doesn't equal 12, I've got the wrong answer, when really you do have the right answer, okay? Um, so x equals negative 25 wouldn't work, and the plus, so you got to keep the positive version of this when you take the square root when you're checking especially. Okay, does that make sense? So you do have, this is why you have to check, because the algebra here with the square roots and stuff could fool you and give you an answer that's actually not right. Okay, so x equals 25, that lines up with our restrictions, and we've checked it, it's good to go. So here's our answer. Any questions on that, guys? Okay, all right. So, let's do another one here from scratch. Your turn, it says, identify any restrictions on y uh, if the radical is a real number. So this is gonna be a real number. It's not gonna be, it's, you know, it's gonna be a positive or zero number and then solve. Okay, so we're going to do the two parts here on this one as well. So A, the restrictions. So what you do is you look at this equation and you say, hey, underneath the radical, that has to be zero or greater. So you literally take everything that's underneath there, everything, and you let that uh, be greater than or equal to zero. That has to be zero or positive. Then you solve. So we'll multiply both sides by five equals no, 5 times 0 is still 0. So 3y is greater than or equal to 0. Uh, y is greater than or equal to 0 over 3. What's 0 divided by 3? 0. Okay. So as long as y is greater than 0, we're good to go. It's positive. Okay. So y has to be greater than 0. Okay. So let's go ahead and solve now. Uh, if we solve that, we've got, um, let's get the Let's get the 8 to the other side. So let's get rid of that negative 8. Let's add 8. So we've got the square root of 3y over 5 equals negative 2 plus 8. And that's going to be negative 2 plus 8, of course. We can simplify that. Is 6. I need to get rid of this radical, so I'm going to do the opposite operation, which is squaring. And if you square one side of the equation, you have to square the other. So again, that's an operation that you can do. You have to do the same to both sides, though. And you have to square the whole side, which I'll get into a, a trickier example later, but you have to square the whole side. So this is going to be 3y over 5 equals 36. So now we've gotten rid of the radical. It's just a straight arithmetic. We'll solve now. Multiply both sides by 5. We get 3y equals 100 and what's that, 80? Divide both sides by 3, we should get, what's that, 60? Okay. So 60, now we, we want to check that, just to see, first of all, so negative 8 plus the square root of 3 times 60 over 5 equals negative 2. That's 180 over 5. So what's 180 over 5? We said was 36. Negative 8 plus square root of 36 is 6. That's negative 2 equals negative 2. We're good to go. So y equals 60. It works with our restrictions. We've checked it out. So there's your answer. Okay? Radical equations. All right? Okay. Any questions about that? Okay, let's take it to the next level then. Okay? So if we have uh, variables, or a variable in two different radicals, in two different radicals, we may have to square both sides of the equation more than once, okay? So this is a more complicated one. So write this one down in your notebook here. Let's solve this together. 7 plus root 3x equals root 5x plus 4 plus 5.
Okay, it's a good idea to at least mental note what your restrictions are. So x has to be if over here. X has to be greater than or equal to zero, right? Can't, this can't be negative. And over on the other side, this has to be this whole thing here has to be greater than or equal to zero. So five x has to be greater than or equal to negative four. X has to be greater than or equal to negative four fifths. Okay, so we'll keep that in mind. And if we have two different restrictions. Um, the, uh, the allowable answers here are where they overlap. So they have to meet both of these criteria. So it has to be greater than 0 and greater than negative 4 over 5. So on a number line, here's 0, here's negative 4 fifths. So it has to be over here and it has to be over here. So look at this. This area right here doesn't work for this part of the equation. So where they overlap, that's where both of them, like both of the, the uh, uh, both of the pieces here uh, are allowable. That's where you want to focus on. So this actually has to be greater than or equal to zero. It cannot be in this region because that will make this thing negative. Okay. So we'll just keep that in mind. Uh, again, if you just if you solve and then you just make sure you check your answers, then you don't need to know this ahead of time. But um, we will. I'll show you this now. So let's solve. Okay, what we want to do is we want to get one side of the equation uh, to have a radical only. Okay, so we want to isolate isolate the radical on one side of the equation. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I am going to isolate this radical because it's got a binomial underneath it. It's a little more complicated than this one. So let's take this five over here. So seven minus five is what? It's going to be two. Okay, so this is what we have now. All right, that's your first step. So isolate one of the radicals. Usually the one with the more terms underneath in the radicand, that's the one you want to isolate. Now, please do not do this, okay? This is a huge no-no, okay? Don't do this next part, okay? Don't do this. Don't think that squaring both sides, don't think that it means this. 4 plus root 3x squared. Okay, don't, don't do this because you cannot square separate terms that you're adding or subtracting. What you need to do is you need to treat this as it really is, which you have to do FOIL. Okay, it's a binomial, that whole thing, times itself. All right, so don't square each term. That's a very common mistake. Every year students do that. Okay, don't fall into that trap. Because I know when you're doing things quick, it's like, oh, just square both terms, that's no problem. It's a binomial. You have to square the whole thing. So this turns out to be 5x plus 4. We're good there. This turns out to be 2 plus root 3x times 2 plus root 3x. So it's going to be 4. Okay, You're going to have plus 2 root 3x plus another 2 root 3x. So that's plus 4 root 3x. And you can write this out as two binomials and do the FOIL if, if you can't do this in your head. No problem. And then when you square root 3x, you get plus 3x. Okay, so that's what you get when you FOIL this out. We're FOILing all this out. That's what you get. Now, the problem is, is we got rid of one radical, but we still have another radical. Okay, no problem. What you want to do is you want to isolate now this radical, the only one that's left. You want to get that all by itself, and then you can square both sides again. So we're going to have to do that process twice. So let's take away 4 from both sides. Oh, this is nice and easy. The constants are all gone. Let's take away 3x. Oh, that's a common term over here, like terms. It's going to be nice and easy. So I've got 4 root 3x equals, what's 5x minus 3x? 2x. Awesome. OK. Now, you could stop right here and square both sides if you want. You could totally do that. Or you could divide both sides by 4 to get rid of this 4 first and then square. It doesn't really matter. If you have one single term, you can square it any time now. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to square this and square this side. And 4 root 3x all squared is like 4 times 4 times root 3x times root 3x. So that's going to be 16 times 3x. And over here is going to be 4x squared. So uh, just once again, if you're lost on that, 
4 root 3x squared is like 4 root 3x times 4 root 3x. You always multiply the numbers, that's 16, and you multiply the radicals. That's root 3x squared, which is going to cancel each other out. That's 16 times 3x, okay? So that we did that earlier in the chapter, right? Just in case you've forgotten. Okay, so now we've got no radicals. Awesome. That's awesome. Uh, except for the fact that we now have x in two different terms. So we can't isolate for x. We can't just get x all by itself equals whatever. It's in two different terms. So how do we approach that? Um, okay, well, let's, let's do this multiplication, actually. Uh, yeah, let's do this multiplication. So 16 times 3 is 30, 48. 48x equals 4x squared. Okay, so I'm going to have 0 equals 4x squared minus 48x. So you have it in two different terms. You should remember from last chapter um, that we can factor and use the zero product principle. And yes, I do have your exams marked. Um, I'll get them back to you eventually. Okay? Your marks are all up in power school, so maybe you've seen that. Yes? Yep. Um, no, this is 48x. Should be 48x. Because this root 3x times root 3x is just 3x. Yeah. So we'll take a 4x out, guys. And we're left with x minus 12. Okay? So from here, we know that if these... If this side is going to equal 0, then either 4x needs to equal 0 or and or x minus 12 needs to equal 0. So x is 0 and x is 12. Those are our two options. Now algebraically, those are the answers we get. And I think I haven't made any mistakes. I've stopped a few times here, so hopefully I haven't missed anything. Thanks for your question over there. Um, is it all this looking correct so far? Okay, so we can check out our restrictions, and both of these values are zero or greater. So they both might work, but we need to check them out. So let's check them out. Um, okay, so uh, let me just do this a quick way. Oh, that's a mess. Okay, so I'm going to just bear with me. I'm gonna copy this out here. Let's do this. Oh, there's my next example. Okay. So if we if we check, we need to put zero in here and zero in there. And what do we get? That's seven plus root zero. So that's zero. Uh, equals root 0 plus 4, so that's root 4 plus uh, 5. Okay, uh, so let's see, does that work? 7 equals 2 plus 5, that's correct. Okay, if I were to do that again, let's try that again, and put 12 in there. So 7 plus root 3 times 12 is 36 equals root, what's 5 times 12 is 60 plus 4 plus 5. Sorry? So we have 7 plus 6 equals square root of 64 is 8 plus 5. That's 13 equals 13. That seems to check out as well. So in this case, we have two answers. Okay? That's a, that's a real big kid problem. Okay? This is, this is a big kid question. All right? This whole section probably is a big good question. I guess we started with a big good question, didn't we? Okay? That was pretty tough, eh? So, in solving this, you have to do your, you have to square both sides twice. You have to check your answers. Okay? And then, and then uh, call it a day. Any questions there? Okay? So, we've, I've got, I think I've got one more example here. Yeah, and then we're done. One more example. Got to do this one because it involves the riders. Go riders. Finished first this year. Awesome. Let's give it up to the Rodgers. Or not. <clears throat> okay, so uh, uh, 
Okay, so solve problems involving radical equations. So there's doubles there, Darian Durant, okay? And uh, it says this. What is the speed in meters per second of a 0.4 kilogram football that has 28.8, that's that J stands for joules, okay, of kinetic energy? Use the kinetic energy formula, E equals one half mv squared, okay, blah, 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 okay, where everything that represents. All right, so two ways you could do this, guys. Listen up. You could plug in all the values right at the beginning with the original equation and solve for the unknown variable, which I would probably suggest. Or you can solve for the unknown variable first uh, and then plug in the values after you've isolated. So two options, you can choose which one you like. Uh, they're both in the book, uh, just so you know. Let's see, where, where is this one here? Right here. So the solutions are both in the book. Solving for V first with all of the variables still intact. Or substituting your numbers in and then solving for V. And this is probably method two is the one I would suggest. Okay? So let's, let's do that. Let's plug in things. So we've got 0.4 kilograms. That's going to be the mass. So I've got 1 half times 0 0.4 here. Uh, I'm looking for the speed, that is V. So V is a variable out there that I don't know. I'm going to leave that as V. And then the energy is what? 28.8 joules. So we've got 28.8 here. So probably this is what I would suggest you do. You do have to pay close attention to your um, order of operations, though. Okay? So please don't um, like don't do anything silly like uh, you know square all of these numbers or something don't don't do that uh, you can multiply these two together but you can't touch this v squared over here so we're going to do that first one half point four is zero point two divide both sides by zero point two okay that's whoops so you get your calculator out there. See, Darian's looking at the calculator there. Uh, 28.8 divided by 0.2. It's 144. It's going to be nice and handy. Equals V squared. Square root of 144 is 12, exactly. So we've got a speed of 12, and that's going to be in meters per second. So 12 meters per second. It's a weird 12 there. That's going to be your answer. Please, uh, when you're dealing with word problems, okay, make sure you include your units. Circle your answers. Show your work. Okay. Make sure you don't forget units, though. All right. Because many of you, like on your tests and assignments, I'm seeing that you're you're stopping here. If it's a word problem, you need to actually answer the question, including the proper units. So make that one final step. All right. So that's the end of this lesson. Maybe it's a bit of a longer lesson, but here's your key ideas. Here's your key ideas. Please look through those. Notice I'm going to highlight this for you. Um, an extraneous root, that's one that is not allowable. And when you have an even exponent that you are raising both sides to, you may run into problems there. So please read through that, and I'll give you your...